Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Climate Refugees and the Impending Crisis. We are joined by Anna Welch, who is the Sam L. Cohen Refugee and Human Rights Clinical Professor at the University of Maine School of Law, and her advisee, Kyle Lonabaugh, a 3L at the University of Maine School of Law. We'll explore what happens when climate change forces people to leave their homes forever, and what international law, refugee law, and immigration policies in general have to say about it. Um, next slide. Oh, there they are. Wonderful. Thank you. And then next slide again. Uh, my name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations work to protect Maine's environment and our democracy by building diverse coalitions, influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Next slide. A few technical notes for today's event. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. You can send your questions to me, Kathleen, through the chat whenever they occur to you. You can find the chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. I'll keep track of the questions and ask those during the Q&A session at the end. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak through the chat and he can help you out. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our website later this afternoon. You can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns there. Thank you all again for joining us. Anna and Kyle, I will turn it over to you. All right, can everybody see my screen there? Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much, Will and Kathleen, for organizing this uh, series and for inviting us to come uh, chat with you all today. So um, Will had asked that I provide a little bit of background about uh, the work we do at the law school uh, and, and the program I run. So we're going to begin with that, and then we'll certainly turn uh, to our uh, topic of the day, climate refugees and the impending crisis. So again, my name is Anna Welch, and I direct our Refugee and Human Rights Clinic, which is a clinical program within Maine Law's Cumberland Legal Aid Clinic. Um, so in the clinic, students are lawyers, the lawyers, even though they're, they're students earning academic credit um, on a range of matters. And in my program, it's specific to immigration law. So students handle cases from asylum, primarily individuals from the Great Lakes region of Africa, the Middle East, Central America. Um, they also handle naturalization cases, family-based petitions. We do a lot of work with immigrant youth who've been abandoned, abused, or neglected by one or both of their parents. Um, and then students also do a ton of um, public outreach and policy and impact work. So um, think of the program, if, you're, if you haven't gone to law school, as sort of akin to medical school residency, right, where students have to uh, work with real patients, but under close supervision. Similarly, in the clinic, students are the lawyers, so they're doing all the work that lawyers would do, but they're doing it under close supervision. So a key focus of the work that students are doing in my program uh, in recent years is on immigrant detention. Um, you've likely heard in the news about the detention of children, of families at our southern border. And we've been sort of at the front lines uh, of some of that work for a number of years. So um, back in 2014 and, and 2015, we sent the first legal team, um, my students, to Artesia, New Mexico. This is when Obama, President Obama was uh, uh, detaining women and children um, uh, in these family detention centers. Um, since then, we've uh, been collaborating extensively with pro bono lawyers at the international law firm Jones Day. And in two years ago, I think now, we began a project um, conducting intakes and legal consults at, down in Laredo, Texas. Um, so there was a detention center, there still is a detention center down in Laredo, Texas, where students would travel for week-long increments. I would go as well, um, meeting with women primarily who were being detained there, um, who had fled Central America. After Trump instituted the Remain in Mexico policy, which uh, probably many of you have heard of, where asylum seekers are now forced to wait in Mexico while seeking asylum, we do still conduct work in Laredo, Texas. So you can see here, see here on this slide, this is the tent courts. This is taken right from the 
office where I was working at a Jones Day. That bridge there is the bridge that connects the United States to, to Mexico and there, that river is the Rio Grande. So we've been conducting remote work with uh, uh, immigrants or asylum seekers who are, are now waiting in, in really uh, dangerous circumstances in Mexico as they, as they apply for asylum. Um, Obviously, the pandemic has greatly impacted our work. So right now, the border is essentially shut down to asylum seekers under Title 42 as the CDC order. Um, and so that work at the southern border is on hold. But we continue to do a lot of detention work. So there's a picture here of two students out of our, the Stratford County um, Department of Corrections, where ICE is detaining more and more immigrants right here in our own backyard at, in Stratford County. And even more recently, we've seen a really big uptick in immigrants detained in our own Cumberland County Jail. So part of the recent work we've been doing uh, involves uh, the Cumberland County Jail. So what we're seeing is a trend of ICE holding immigrants for just a period of two or three days that they pick up maybe in other areas of New England and they move them to CCJ and then they're held there again two to three days and then quickly move down to Louisiana or Georgia, sort of fast tracked to deport them. I think ICE thinks of Maine as um, a dark dark hole without a lot of uh, lawyers, but we're we're now uh, we're we're on to them, and we filed actually a complaint in federal court with respect to one individual uh, recently who we were uh, fearful would be quickly uh, sent down to Louisiana and then deported. Another big project students have been working on is you may have heard it in the news just uh, last week. Um, Maine asylum seekers are experiencing a dramatic decline in asylum approvals out of the Boston Asylum Office, and we're trying to get to the bottom of why that's happening, where the people who are coming to Maine are fleeing violence that's really protracted and, and well corroborated in Burundi, for example, or in Angola, and, uh, and yet they're losing their asylum cases at the Boston Asylum Office. So the students filed a complaint along with uh, ACLU of Maine and the Immigrant Legal Advocacy Project to compel the government to release documentation to find out uh, with respect to a recently filed Freedom of Information Act request to find out what's happening and why why we're losing those cases. So, sorry, kind of a long-winded <laughs> summary of what we're doing. We're doing a lot. There's a lot going on in the world of immigration. Um, and I'm happy to field any questions at the end about sort of the work at the law school uh, and uh, as well as sort of questions that might come up uh, related to the topic at hand. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to talk about the cause of climate change and the unique problems uh, it poses. But first, Kyle, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit more, um, that would be great as well. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm a third year <clears throat> law student at University of Maine School of Law. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Maine and I studied anthropology with a minor in earth science. And I focused on how people uh, interact with the environment. And in law school, my hope was to continue that. So last spring for my independent writing project, I was able to do so uh, by focusing on climate change refugees and their lack of legal status. So I just focused on how climate change will affect migration. Um, how, what that means under the current refugee system, what other laws across the globe are gonna be impacted and what could be done to address that issue. Um, so just some background, as many of you know, uh, climate change will affect many people in a variety of ways. As the climate changes, people will be displaced uh, in different ways, but there are three general categories. Uh, we will see that I discussed in my paper, uh, sea level rise, desertification, and more frequent and extreme uh, weather events. Um, often this is slow internal to the nation of displacement and temporary in the case of extreme weather events, as well as mixed with other causes such as poverty and war when forcing people to migrate. Um, some of these events are slow. Think of it as the uh, adage, it's climate change, not weather. Um, you're gonna see long-term broad patterns causing people to move. Internal to the nation of displacement means people often stay within the borders of that nation. They may move from town to town or state to state, but not uh, outside their host country or home country, sorry. Uh, and the temporary nature is really a misnomer as many places will become uninhabitable, uh, uninhabitable due to the disasters repeatedly causing damage. Uh, next slide, please. So sea level rise, uh, as the climate changes, we, we will see sea level rise. There's no denying that. However, um, it's slow. We might not know the true effects for 30 years. Um, 
and it'll force people to move because land will either be uninhabitable or unsustainable for living. Um, it doesn't just have to make islands vanish as the stereotype may be, but it can lead to displacement from submerged land, salt leaching into drinking water uh, or, farm, or potable water and a loss of habitable land. It'll make land uninhabitable due to the lack of clean water, both for farming and drinking, and unsustainable due to the loss of land from overcrowding. Next slide, please. Um, desertification is another uh, thing, cause or, uh, effect of climate change. It'll also take time as rain patterns and temperature change slowly once arable land will become arid and uninhabitable and unsustainable due to climate change. Uh, for example, parts of Syria starting in 2007 till around 2010 were facing extreme drought uh, that was historic and it forced many people to move, um, exacerbating the already existing issues. This can also combine with economic issues as farmers will be forced to move. People may not see this as climate migrants, but the true cause, cause is climate change uh, taking away their livelihood, forcing people to move. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the last kind of catch-all category is extreme and severe, uh, more frequent and severe weather events. It'll take many, it'll make many places unsustainable for people to live as they continuously face more natural disasters. They're increasing in intensity. Uh, in the United States, for example, think of the wildfires we've uh, saw last spring. Um, and a more global example is Cyclone Ida in Mozambique displaced 146,000 people. Um, while most of those, this is pretty indicative of what uh, climate migrants will face. They, most of these people stayed within the borders of Mozambique, um, representing the internal nature as well. They, uh, these are often thought of as temporary, but as we have seen, uh, these are predictably happening more and more frequently. Uh, more and more storms like this are happening, displacing people consistently. Mozambique, for example, will be facing more cyclones like Ida, continuously displacing people. Next slide. Okay, so the next question is what happens to those then who are displaced um, either by climate change or by violence or, or civil unrest? As Kyle mentioned, many end up displaced within their home countries living in uh, temporary situations, but many also flee to neighboring countries. So in 2010, I, I worked as a refugee resettlement officer in Kenya with a non-governmental organization, Refuge Point, which is based out of Massachusetts. And we were under contract with UNHCR to conduct uh, refugee interviews and referrals. And so I took some pictures from, from my work there and I thought I could sort of just walk you through what life looks like for, for many of the refugees who, who do flee their home countries to, to, neighboring, uh, to neighboring countries. So Kenya is home to one of the world's largest refugee camps. This is the a picture of Dadaab refugee camp, which borders um, Somalia, so it's in Northern Kenya. And it's known for violence, for terrorist attacks and threats, malnutrition, lack of schooling. Some children are born here and raised here and don't know any other life. Um, it's also, as you can see, extremely arid. So there's a lack of water and other basic human rights. So given the conditions in these camps, many refugees are now settling in urban, urban areas. And so my work was primarily out of Nairobi. Um, about two thirds of the world's refugees now live in urban settings. Um, and this is a picture I took. I apologize for the quality of it. We weren't, it wasn't safe to be carrying a camera. So I took some quick, very blurry shots. Um, but you can see this is where, um, this is this is home to thousands of, of refugees. So they're living in sort of really the poorest of the neighborhoods in Nairobi in these, um, you know, really shacks, so sheds with these corrugated tin roofs. Um, many of them lack access to, um, you know, to work, to schooling, to medical care. I think people do come to the cities because there's a hope maybe of a better life, um, but there's obviously still many uh, dangers. There's a risk of exploitation and violence. Um, this was inside one of those, um, one of those sheds. Uh, many of the children, this is revisited here on a, on a work day, a school day, the kids are out of school, many of them are unaccompanied, uh, many are at risk of exploitation. So the conditions in Nairobi um, really reflect, I think, the conditions that many refugees face uh, around the world um, as they flee their, their homelands to, to escape, uh, whether it's 
um, you know, climate change or violence or, or unrest. This is a street as well in uh, Kenya where you can see sort of there's open sewer, um, really poor sanitation. Most, a lot of people have to, you know, take any means necessary to survive, including through going through trash. This was the inside of one of the homes that we visited. It was an apartment, really, it was a one room um, place that eight people shared, five people slept on that bed and three on the floor and that in the corner there, that's their kitchen. So, you know, really the living conditions are, are pretty, um, pretty horrible. And, uh, and generally the conditions both in the refugee camps and in uh, the urban settings are uh, far less than ideal. So these are just some additional photos that I took through that work. So let's talk numbers. So how many people around the world are displaced? Well, these are some statistics from the UNHCR at the end of 2019. And the numbers are just really, I mean, they're just going up year, every year, the numbers are just continuing to rise. So right now, an unprecedented 79.5 million people around the world have been uh, forced from their homes. So 45.7 million of those are internally displaced people. So these are people, I think, as Kyle mentioned, who have left their homes, but they're, they're still within their own home country. So they're, they're internally displaced um, within their country. 26 million uh, of the 79.5 are refugees. And then we'll talk in a minute about who is a refugee, how do you qualify? Uh, nearly half of, of that 26 million are uh, under the age of 18. And then 4.2 million are stateless people who have been denied a nationality and basic, uh, basic rights. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to walk you through. So these are sort of the current figures with respect to displaced people. And he can discuss the rise in displaced people due to uh, climate change. Oh, actually, no, sorry. <laughs> I jumped too soon. So uh, just a quick sort of breakdown. Um, UNHCR also publishes every year. A breakdown of where refugees are coming from and also which countries are the primary hosts. Now, the international treaties that um, over 140 countries have on, signed on to is this idea of collective responsibility, right, for, for refugees. But unfortunately, that responsibility really falls into just a, a few, a handful of countries. So 68% of our refugees come from just these five countries. And then the top hosts for refugees are, are these uh, additional uh, five countries. Um, at the end of the day, less than 1% of the 26 million refugees are resettled uh, each year. So the United States used to be one of the, the, the better countries with respect to re refugee resettlement numbers. So we accepted, in, uh, in the past, we accepted more refugees than any of the other uh, signatory countries combined. But as you probably know from following the news, that number has uh, dropped dramatically. So. In previous years, we resettled between 55,000 and 120,000 refugees each year. Um, that number is set by the president, so that's why you see sort of this, um, this fluctuation of, of numbers, and obviously it falls along uh, political lines. Um, pr former President Obama had allocated 110 refugee admissions for 2017, um, but when Trump took office, he cut that uh, by more than half. And then also, you might recall the, uh, the travel ban, the Muslim ban, and, and, the, and the temporary halt of refugee resettlement altogether. And then in this past fiscal year, he capped it at just 18,000, which was an all-time uh, low for the United States. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to talk about uh, the rise in displaced people and sort of the, what, what that might look like uh, for these numbers moving forward. Uh, so climate change will displace an extremely large number of people. Estimates do vary, but we do know it's going to be a large number of people. Um, importantly, these may be different depending on the severity of climate change, as well as often combined with other issues. As the most uh, recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report in 2014 acknowledged, uh, that climate change migration is hard to classify as there's so many different factors. Um, as previously mentioned, things like sea level rise will also cause saltwater intrusion, leading sub to subsistence, subsistence issues, causing people to move for economic reasons, or drought causing farmers to seek greener pastures. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. So with that said, how many people will be forced to migrate? Um, 200 million is a consistent estimate that I've seen, and it will be at least in the millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. Um, some regional estimates help to exemplify this issue. For example, the World Bank said that if no action by 2050 is taken, there will be more than 143 million uh, 
climate migrants across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. Um, another example is in the Pacific Islands. Uh, we, there's about 2.3 million people who live there. And while not every single person will be forced to leave, many of them are vulnerable to climate change. Um, and we already are seeing people displaced, however. Uh, according to Brookings Institute, uh, in 2017, about 68 million people were displaced. Of those 22 to 24.5 uh, million were from weather events, including that cyclone Ida that I was talking about earlier. So we're already seeing more intense weather events causing this move among other issues. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean for the refugee system? Um, it means by doing this, you will have so many people who need a place to live because it will be unsustainable for them to live where they are, uh, if not outright impossible. Uh, one case that went before the United Nations Human Rights Committee demonstrates this well, uh, Tietoa v. Uh, v New Zealand. Um, while this case was celebrated for opening the door for climate change refugees, it warrants some hesitation uh, the court set a high bar, and I think that was in part because they saw how many people this would add to an already stressed system. As Anna pointed out, only 1% of people are ultimately resettled. So I think the court was hesitant to add more people to a category like this. Um, I own Tia Toa and his family provide a great example for what many people will face and the struggles with adding climate migrants to the refugee category. He and his family faced a lack of potable water, like 60% of the population on his island of Tarawa. Um, overcrowding, potential violence, among, um, among ah, many other issues. Yet despite this, he was ultimately not given non refoulement status, meaning he had to return to Kiribati because he was not in imminent danger. This is what so many people will face. Um, it's a hard fought issue that may not meet the definition of refugee. And even if it does, there will be hesitancy to give people this non refoulement status due to all the previously mentioned factors with climate migrants and refugees. Uh, so now uh, I'll turn it back over to Anna, or Professor Welch. So then what are the options that folks who have been displaced have? Um, and the answer is it really depends. So if they fled their home country and now are in a second Country. Sort of, the UNHCR has sort of three options with respect to displaced people. So one is um, voluntary repatriation. The idea here is that folks, it has to be fully voluntary, right? Not forced repatriation, but they can go back to their home country, right? Maybe conditions have improved. The other is local integration into that host country. So, um, and this requires more than just sort of temporary status. It's got to be some sort of permanent status to locally integrate now with, with the host country. And then finally, the sort of last option is uh, refugee resettlement. And the idea here is uh, a select few are able to resettle to a third country, such as the United States or Canada or New Zealand and so on. All three of these really pose uh, incredible, often insurmountable challenges, right? So as I said, voluntary repatriation is often different, difficult, right? Where the situation that folks are fleeing is, is typically protracted. Local integration is very difficult. I know in Kenya, uh, incredibly difficult given the xenophobia and lack of resources in, in the host country. And as I said, resettlement um, is really uh, just for a select few. Despite the need for this shared or collective responsibility, again, we see just a few countries really bearing the brunt uh, of the crisis. So why are so few people resettled? I think one, again, is sort of the political climate, depending on the country where they're being resettled to and the, and the quotas um, that countries institute. Um, but also just the definition of a refugee itself is very narrow. So refugee law is derived from international law and the principal uh, international instrument uh, for those fleeing political persecution uh, was the 1951 United Nations Convention relating to the status of, of refugees and the 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees. And that convention defined the term refugee and also outlines rights of displaced people. And at the heart of that document is this principle of non-refoulement, right? So uh, no, not forced repatriation back to your home country. You shouldn't be returned to a country where you would face uh, you know, a risk of 
a, a threat to your life or, or to your freedom. You know, 145 nations have signed on to these treaties uh, and the U.S. has ratified them and we enacted uh, statutory measures under the Refugee Act of 1980. Um, what does it mean to be a refugee? Well, here's the definition of a refugee and don't even worry about trying to read this, uh, this slide. There's so much legalese sort of packed in here, but let me break it down. Um, what's not here is that it does require that you've left your home country. So already right there, um, most climate change refugees are ineligible because many of them, as Kyle mentioned, are internally displaced, displaced within their own country. So refugee first requirement is you fled your own country to another country. You suffered past persecution, have a well-founded fear of future persecution, harm is caused by a government, the government or a group or person the government can't control or won't control. And then here's the real um, real challenge for, for refugees. If you have left your home country, uh, so you meet that requirement, the, the other um, challenge is, can you prove this nexus, right? You've got to show that the harm you fear or face um, or faced already was on account of one of these five grounds. And so this is really a just disqualifying requirement for most of the climate uh, change um, refugees because many of them have fled um, natural disaster. And even if you if you flee sort of general civil unrest as a result of sort of natural disasters or, or slow climate change, that wouldn't be enough, right? You've got to really uh, fit within one of these narrow uh, categories. Um, so um, yeah, so I think the, the refugee system as of now is not going to solve the, the problem. Again, primarily because the numbers are so low, but also secondarily, the definition of refugee would need to be expanded uh, to permit uh, climate change refugees uh, uh, to qualify. So I'll turn it back over to you, Kyle. What are, the, what are our solutions? <laughs> um, thanks. Uh... So as Professor Welch just explained, climate change refugees aren't really a thing. So there is a wide range of approaches to climate change migration across the globe. Um, it's important to note that some of these policies aren't actually geared towards uh, climate migration, um, but have been suggested by scholars and others as potential solutions. And I would say there's four general groupings of actions or potential actions being taken. Uh, next slide, please. So the first is active deterrence. Um, this is when countries actively work to keep people out of uh, their country. Um, some examples are cooperative deterrence and non-entree policies. Um, they, these can be quite aggressive. Uh, Italy, for example, cooperated with Libya uh, to keep people out of Italy. And part of that was loaning uh, battleship, I believe, to the Libyan government. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then there's temporary solutions that do not uh, actually address environmental issues. Um, temporary actions that could include migrants, but don't uh, address these environmental causes. Uh, they work in general by someone is allowed to stay in their host country um, temporarily due to some event forcing them to leave their home country. Uh, the United States has something that will, I will address a little bit later when I discuss the uh, US. And, but for now, I'll stick with the EU has a program called Temporary Protective Directive. It's geared towards mass influxes of people. It's for a year, but can be extended. And is aimed at people who would be seeking uh, refugee or asylum status, like Anna just, or Professor Walsh just talked about. It is broad, but rarely used. And again, it's, it's not geared towards the environment. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then these are uh, similar to what I just discussed, but there's temporary solutions geared towards the environment itself. Um, again, they're very similar to what I just discussed, but they actually do address uh, environmental issues. The Aliens Acts in Finland and Sweden, for example, do this. These are fairly permissive immigration laws. They allow for temporary uh, relocation within Finland and Sweden, and they allow for people who are displaced by environmental disaster or catastrophe, um, respectively, to relocate. So they do uh, directly address this environmental issue, but they actually have not been used successfully. So most scholars 
aren't really sure how this would work or if these are really viable solutions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and lastly, there's regional approaches and treaties. Um, the treaty and regional approach for climate migrants are essentially when two or more countries make some sort of agreement that will help people displaced by climate and, or environmental causes to move. Um, a good example of this is migration with dignity, which was a policy pursued by Kiribati. Uh, it basically helped train people uh, to uh, meet skilled labor shortages in New Zealand and Australia, and then helped move those people to those countries. Um, it had a goal of creating a win-win situation for Kiribati in places like New Zealand and Australia because they were facing short uh, a shortage of skilled labor jobs. Uh, um, However, there were some problems encountered uh, where it often excluded those who were most vulnerable to climate change. It did not sufficiently meet your body's needs and it relied on the hospitality of others, which uh, given the change in many of these countries' policies, it's not necessarily the best place to be in. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the US currently doing? Uh, the US does not actually currently have a way to address climate change refugees. Um, temporary protected status has been given as a possible solution, but as it stands now, there's some, more, there's some issues. Um, TPS is a temporary solution where designation is given for either uh, some situation in which someone could not safely be expected to go back to their home country. Once the designation has been given, it allows that person to stay temporarily, though this can be extended uh, one example showing how this is a little bit broader than refugee and asylum status is Haiti with the earthquake um, in 2010. It's still allowing uh, people to stay in the United States. And while it's not climate related, it does show the broader reach of uh, TPS. Uh, the issues, however, though, it's temporary, thus it does not truly solve the problem as well, given that it, it requires a designation, which is unlikely under the current administration. and any administration, to be honest, given the nature and complexities of climate change, it would be hard to get a designation. Uh, next slide. So what can we do from here? Uh, what should our immigration policy be doing? Broadly speaking, my writing project suggestion was to use the treaties and regional framework. And I feel as though this can be a workable solution. What I mean by regional framework is a group of nations that share an area come together to address common issues. Um, a good example of this is in the Pacific nations, there's the Pacific Islands Forum, which while it has not directly addressed climate uh, migration issue uh, with any meaningful policy, it still represents a region that has worked together on this issue and a regional framework to uh, be the vehicle for change. The Pacific Islands Forum has a vision for region for a region of peace, harmony, security, social inclusion, prosperity, so that all Pacific people can lead free, healthy, and productive lives. It works to promote regionalism and cooperation between countries in the Pacific, including Australia and New Zealand. So it's important to note that it is working with the Pacific Island nations and New Zealand and Australia. Um, it often does focus on climate and environmental issues, trying to promote equitable solutions while there hasn't been a direct uh, climate migration issues, it is something they discuss frequently. Um, while this general approach, uh, there are problems potentially with it as how will it be funded, enforced, and how will we get people to buy into this solution? It has worked to some extent in the Pacific and could work abroad. However, it's important to note some strong cultural and political differences between the Americas and the Pacific. Um, there tends to be greater unity in the Pacific and they tend to work together on issues like climate change. They still have disagreements, but they're much less vehement than ours. Um, even under a new administration, the solution would require a lot of coordination and work with our neighbors to help meet their needs and get buy-in from the people within the US. Um, I advocate for an expansion of something like Migration with Dignity, uh, where PIF would help to promote it. Another solution would be to expand TPS in some manner. Um, given the nature of TPS as it stands, it would be problematic to use. However, an expansion would allow it to be 
somewhat uh, potential sol solution. Um, in order to expand it, it would need to include some sort of permanent solution, perhaps if after a set amount of years, the land, the nation was still uninhabitable, the, uh, a permanent path to citizenship would open up. As well, make it inherent that climate change is designatable. Instead of making climate change effects a designation, just make climate change a designatable. <clears throat> make countries facing climate change design have, give them a designation. Importantly, no matter what, we need to advocate for working with countries that will struggle, understand what their plight is and that it is our plight. It's important to remember that the countries that will be most affected from climate change are the countries that did little to nothing to contribute to climate change. The US and other countries benefited from greenhouse gas emissions and should help those who did not play a role in this crisis, yet will be harmed most by it. Right now, the US is not doing anything and we have no true viable path. We need to advocate for those who are most vulnerable and disproportionately affected by climate change, including those who will be forced to migrate. Well, that's the conclusion of our presentation, but we very much welcome any questions or, or additional thoughts that folks might have on, on this topic or anything else that we've talked about today. Wonderful. Um, Kathleen, I think, is having some technical issues. So I'm going to, oh, there she comes. Oh, I'm back. Thank you. There it is. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was just so fascinating. Anna and Kyle, thank you so much. Um, we already have a good list of questions that have come in. So I think we'll, we'll dive right into them. And then uh, folks, keep those questions coming and we'll, we'll add them to the list. Before, I think maybe we'll go with the ones that came in early on in your presentation and, and work up to the to the end. So just a sort of level setting on, on where we are now. Uh, who has picked up the slack on the acceptance of refugees in this last period of time when the US has really uh, cut those numbers? Yeah, so I think it goes back, let me go back to that initial slide. Germany has been a big um, host country. Um, you've probably read about sort of all their different initiatives, um, but really it's the neighboring countries, right? So it's Turkey, uh, it's Colombia, so uh, neighboring Venezuela, um, Pakistan and, and Uganda. And so um, I, those are the primary host countries uh, for refugees. And again, it, it tends to fall on those who are closest in, in geography to uh, the countries that, that folks are fleeing. And then you, you cited this number that only 1% of refugees are resettled each year. What happens to everybody else? So that goes back to um, that, that image I shared with you of um, the Dadaab refugee camp. I mean, again, that, that camp has been around, for, I think, since the 70s. Um, don't quote me exactly on that, but you, there's actually a ton that you can read about Dadaab uh, online. Um, but there are children who are born there and now are adults there and having their own families there. I mean, they're just living in these temporary, but meant for to be temporary, but now permanent um, settlements that are far from ideal. So yeah, we've got 26 million uh, refugees at the end of 2019, less than 1% resettled. So what happens? Again, some may go back to their home countries because it's certainly with the conditions in Dadaab, again, sometimes the, the conditions are worse in the host country than they were uh, in, in the country, in their home countries that they were fleeing. Maybe they'll locally integrate. You know, I think a lot of when I was in Kenya, there was just, it was so unlikely that we were going to be able to help them resettle to Canada or to the United States that many were sort of looking at creating a life for themselves if they could. But after the terrorist attacks at the, at the I can't remember the name of that mall that was in Nairobi just a few years ago and the continuing xenophobia and crackdown by the Kenyan police, uh, some folks, you know, they're just, they're living in a life of limbo. So it, it's really just so striking to think um, we're not we're not meeting the current crisis and then Kyle all of the the information you shared it's um, about to get a lot worse yeah and uh, and xenophobia and racism are clearly a big part of of those challenges um, I don't know that there's a question there 
And I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's an idea of like collective responsibility, but also requires collective leadership. And I think what we've seen is just a real um, lack of collective uh, leadership and, and, and even leadership uh, from the United States on these important issues. So, and given sort of this impending crisis, the title of this talk today, something has to be done because this isn't going to go away uh, on its own. And so, um, you know, and, and it will, as, as Kyle mentioned, lead to uh, unrest and violence um, as well, and certainly just massive shortages. Is there an effort to establish a, a new international definition of, of refugees or a new category of climate refugees or, or something that extends the, the process or the, the options available to the folks who are being most impacted right now? Or what, what are the possibilities there? Kyle, do you wanna take a crack at that one? Yeah. Um... I, so when I was doing the research, uh, it was at a pretty, there was a lot of change going on. So that court case I was discussing, uh, Tia Toa versus New Zealand, um, that showed there is like a large push among uh, the community to try to keep doing this. And it did show a little bit of a leaning from the UN to maybe change their stance on this issue, I think. Uh, as well, you, I did see some scholarship on it uh, that was people promoting either getting a new category or you have to change the definition and there does need to be something to be done. But I, I don't think I quite saw as much of like a formal advocacy group uh, approach. Like I don't think I saw a lot of one big formal group pushing for this change. I There is a lot of fragmented, we need to deal with this issue, but there wasn't, there isn't necessarily like an advocacy group for it. So I think that's kind of what I saw. I think that's right. And I think the UNHCR certainly has this at the fore uh, of, of some of the work they're doing. I think there's an acknowledgement that there is no such thing as a climate change refugee under the legal term, right? Because they don't meet the definition of a refugee and it would require uh, a change, but I think back to sort of what Kyle was saying as well is like changing the definition of a refugee won't solve the problem where less than 1% of refugees already are not, you know, are, are resettled. Um, and so there needs to be more than just a definition change. Yeah. And, and also just thinking about the, the different lenses through which we can look at this crisis, there's the, the legal questions that, that you all have helped us understand much better and obvious humanitarian concerns. Um, but the national security issues, I mean, is there any more likelihood of, of sort of motivating governments through that frame, uh, the national security one? I think, unfortunately, the national security lens has been used um, by many countries as an exclusionary tool. And so we see instead of using national security as a way to think, okay, if we don't address it, it will create a national security crisis. We're saying, well, these foreigners, these, these people who look different from us who might practice a different religion from us or have different color skin from us, we need to exclude them from our borders. Um, and so I think it's the national security, unfortunately, is that narrative is being you know, used in a way that's unproductive to, to exclude, which we've seen in the past. I mean, I just taught a race and in, in racial injustice in, in immigration law earlier this week to a group of law students um, looking back all the way back to the Chinese Exclusion Act and the parallel to the to the Muslim man, um, which now I'm getting a little bit off track. But I think national security, certainly sort of big picture, we should think of this as a national security threat if we don't become more welcoming and come up with a strategic plan. But unfortunately, I think it's been the short sighted use of that of that narrative that's made us close our borders even more. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, really, really interesting conversation about the migration with dignity work and, and that ability to do sort of proactive resettlement. Uh, we've talked about that in Maine, right? That there are, are we, have, we need more workers, we need more people. Uh, what, are you seeing any of those connections? Like how is that work showing up in Maine, if at all? You're muted, Kyle, I think. Yeah, uh, um, that's interesting. I, I actually haven't seen it in Maine. Uh, I didn't necessarily look too much into it for my paper. So that is something 
I could look into later. Uh, I do know there is in Louisiana, um, there was actually a federal, federally funded project to move people. Um, I think it's Isle St. Charles, I want to say. Um, and that was a project to move like a small village of around 480 people. Um, in Maine, I haven't seen any like formal uh, proactivity, although I do know there's talk of like insurance companies and how they'll insure coastal homes and just like the behavior changes via economic vehicles, but I'd have to do more research on specifics. Yeah, and states, um, so immigration law falls under federal law. So states really, they have no say in terms of um, who can come into the country or into even their own state or who can, should be excluded or even deported. But that doesn't mean states don't play a role. I mean, I think we all know there are immigrant friendly states and less than, uh, less than friendly states sort of comparing Arizona, for example. And I don't know if you folks are following back in like 2010, 2011, SB 1070. So all these laws that were enacted that actually made it a crime um, to, you know, work illegally or, you know, things like that. And in Maine, I think we are known for being more, more welcoming um, and sort of this idea of migration with dignity, although, you know, that's not universal to, to all of Maine. Um, but I think Maine in particular, where we do face labor shortages, we have an aging population um, and a need for um, also healthcare workers, et cetera. I think there's a huge need for, for immigrants and the skilled work and uh, that they can bring into the state. But um, again, um, Maine itself, we can't sort of, we can, we can create Im immigrant friendly initiatives that might get folks who are already in the United States into the state, but we can't do anything to get folks who are um, displaced into the, into the country. Gotcha, gotcha. And of course, you know, Kyle, what, what you were pointing out too is that there may very well be some climate migration within Maine and, and within the United States. Uh, I know I know my town has seen a huge increase in, in migration to a, for COVID purposes, right? So um, we're looking at a lot of people moving around the world um, for a lot of reasons. Which I think highlights the earlier point, which is most, a lot of folks, the majority who are displaced because of climate change or natural disasters are internally displaced, right? So we, as, as you said, Kathleen, we see a lot more people from California or the, the fire, you know, where all these fires are in, in the West coming or wanting to move to Maine um, as well. So internally displaced. So while we're, we're doing this sort of big picture work of, of managing and thinking about how to better manage these migration patterns, uh, what kind of work can we do sort of on the ground to do for climate resilience that might reduce to some extent uh, the need for migration? And I'm thinking like regenerative <laughs> yeah. soil practices or oh, you know, all of the okay. things that we're doing I, to try to make, make the world um, more yeah. livable for longer. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, there's a lot, uh, and it, it is such a global issue, it's hard to really pinpoint. I guess at a local level, um, I'm trying to think, because I know there are some places that try to use raised homes for your sea level rise. Uh, if they're um, trying to think, atolls, uh, I've seen like some people who live in atolls think of that as like a potential solution. Um, on the ground for resilience, I think just it's gonna have to be a lot of behavior change to slow it down on a global scale. And to be honest, like on a small scale, how do we deal with desertification? How do we deal with the sea level rise? Uh, I actually am not totally sure. I haven't done a ton of research on that. Um, so I'd have to do some more and get back to you. But one thing I have seen is the idea of maybe raising homes and trying to deal with that. Uh, as well, what your body does do, whether it's successful or not, is debatable, is they have water authorities that distribute the water. Um, so when I mentioned that he, uh, Tiatoa has to get water from the authority, that didn't used to be the case. They used to, 100% of people on that island had access to fresh, clean drinking water, and now it's down to 40%. So just governments somehow distributing water where it's needed um, 
as people lose access to that might be something to do. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's the what we as an individual can do versus what we can do as sort of a collective. I think all of us individually, there's so many individual choices we can make that can help. You know, what was the expression someone said like about the use of just using a straw, right? If it's like, well, it's just one straw, but if billions of people say that, right, then you've got billions of straws that are polluting the planet. So if we individually sort of make good choices about the environment, which cars we're driving, um, how we're getting to and from work, et cetera. But I think obviously that there needs to be a lot of political pressure. And I think under this administration, we're seeing just a reversing of so many important environmental initiatives and, and laws. And I think we we need to move forward and and put a lot of pressure on our um, on our politicians. Um, and I think just staying informed and I imagine sort of donating to the different causes as well who are, who are organizations who are working on this on the ground. And I think from the perspective of immigration law, I think um, more minds need to be coming together in the United States even, I'm hoping under this new administration and thinking collectively about, okay, what will we do? And I think Kyle's idea of sort of expanding temporary protective status to perhaps have a path to permanency, other things with again, um, and, and states being involved. I mean, similarly, states are involved with respect to how many refugees through the resettlement process each state will get. And so thinking about, okay, well, um, how many more can we admit? Um, and, and and can a number of those be those who are maybe displaced because of natural disasters or, or climate change? But yeah, I wish I had the answers to how do we <laughs> how do we solve this problem as an individual? But I think all politics is local, right? So I think start at our local levels, uh, even our community, um, you know, our, our our city council members, et cetera, and, and then all the way up to our president. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're about to get a new president. And I'm curious about what what you all are thinking about some of the top, you know, what's on your top first hundred days list of what should happen. Uh, I don't have a direct path to make that. <laughs> I don't have a magic wand, but what would we do if we could? Well, all you really need is a is a ballpoint pen okay. uh, for a lot of the initiatives that happen because immigration um Again, it's federal law and Congress has done nothing uh, since 19, really since 1996. So most of the changes we're seeing in immigration have come from the executive branch. So if you think about some of these huge things like separation of children, the detention of children away from parents, um, the remain in Mexico policy, the now shutting down the southern border entirely to asylum seekers, those with a stroke of a pen can be gone. The Muslim bans, sort of the so-called Muslim, gone. Uh, they're increasing the refugee numbers. I mean, those could be, we could set it at a million if we wanted to, right? And so that could change. So there's a lot that can be done on day one. Um, all that, all this detention work we're doing where immigration and customs enforcement is, you know, in the middle of a huge pandemic is transferring people through all these different facilities causing huge out, outbreaks in these facilities. stop that right stop detaining there are so many alternatives to detention ankle bracelets being one of them just simple reporting most people despite the rhetoric out there most people do show up for their court hearings because they do want to gain status in the united states so detention is a huge money maker so you've got to have the will to end uh, detention but there is a lot this, this next and there's, there's hope uh, that this next administration can do. Yeah, that is that's really encouraging. Uh, and and I guess you know as we're thinking about what's ahead, Kyle, a, a question for you. You're in your last year of of law school. What what happens from here? Having done this work as a student, uh, what are you thinking about next? Uh, I guess just advocacy like on this issue i think um i guess that's a little bit shameful plug but uh i'm hoping to get this paper published that i did in the spring um and i guess just like kind of trying to expand and see like what i personally can do as a difference um as well i hope to i mean i went to law school to work with the environment so i'm hoping to some way do that i uh, also have interest in uh, business and I've looked into that career path. So maybe I know Maine really likes environmentally sustainable businesses. So trying to figure out some way to combine those two interests is something I hope to do. So He's on the market. So if anyone listening in has ideas for Kyle, he'd be a real asset to anyone. I was supervising him on his paper. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> that, that is, I have no doubt. That's incredible. Uh, and Anna, what does the, the program look like? How many, you know, what do you, what's next for you? Yeah, so our program really evolves. Obviously, the primary goal is educating students, but we do that through uh, meeting acute needs of the community, and those are evolving. So the hope is we can get back down to Laredo, Texas, and do work there. Um, I think had uh, the, the election gone a different way, I think the border would have just remained shut down, which means the program would probably be shut down. But now I think we're going to be quite busy um, trying to process individuals uh, who've been stuck in Mexico, assuming that Biden ends the uh, Remain in Mexico policy. Um, but we're, I don't imagine imagine immigrant detention is going away anytime soon. So we're going to continue that work um, both here at Stratford and, and perhaps if uh, it continues here at Cumberland County Jail. There's, um, you know, an uh, indefinite right now at this point, number of refugees right here in Maine, asylum seekers um, who, who need our help as, as well as a growing number of immigrant uh, children. So we're just going to keep doing this important work and, um, you know, our projects will shift depending on the needs of, of the community around us. Well, thank you so much uh, for the work that you do and for uh, for sharing it with us today. It's been just a really fascinating conversation. Uh, so grateful to, to all of you who joined us together today. Uh, thank you, Will. So a couple of follow-up or last minute things. We will send out a survey later this afternoon along with a recording of this program. Uh, got messages from many of you during the, the conversation about who you wished could be could be watching along with you. So this is your opportunity to, to forward that link and, uh, and broaden the, the base of folks engaged in this. Uh, so that you all know we are taking a break next week for the Thanksgiving holiday and hope that you will, will join us in doing some reflecting and connecting and really thinking about uh, what, you're, what you're thankful for and also the, the origins and history of the Thanksgiving holiday. In that follow-up email this afternoon, we'll share some uh, resources from our, our partners in the tribes of Maine about decolonizing Thanksgiving and encourage you to, to read some of those essays and, and dig into some of those resources. When we're back at it on the, this Friday, December 4th, we will have Dr. Kate McMahon from the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. We'll be exploring the role of Maine in the global slave trade and how African Americans in Maine resisted slavery and fought for their freedom. So a really good program. Hope you enjoy the week and um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you again for having us. Take care. Uh, thank you for having us.